Hey there, welcome to another video. In this video, we're gonna continue solving quadratics and we're gonna find some x-intercepts, but we're gonna focus on a technique called factoring. Now, you might be like, I know factoring. You might. There's a lot of different ways to factor. I've seen many, many good techniques. I'm gonna give you the best technique that I've ever seen. Uh, so I'm gonna show you exactly how I factor, how I go through the process, Hopefully you can open your mind a little bit and say, wow, that, that's pretty cool. Because I guarantee a lot of you haven't seen it unless you watch some of my videos from Intermediate Algebra. Uh, what, what typically happens is I see a lot of students make it to a pre-calculus level and they've either forgotten factoring, which is okay, I'm gonna teach that to you, or, or their technique is misapplied and they start using shortcuts, probably know what I'm talking about, and they'll do it wrong. Uh, they'll go, oh yeah, that works, I'm gonna do it every time. And the shortcut they learn doesn't work every time. I promise you I'm going to teach you a shortcut that will work every single time for factoring. So the idea, again, what we're getting into is we have these things called quadratics. They all make parabolas. We're going to be finding the x-intercepts, the zeros, the roots, and seeing, um, seeing how to do that. One good technique for it. So what I want to talk about is that this is the second technique you try. So we're going to talk about how the square root method is going to work for none of these. I'll kind of preface the next section and say, how would you make the square root method work? Um, and then we'll talk about factoring and, and why that would be a great technique for these. So let's, let's look at the very first one. Number one, man, that's a quadratic. And if we want to find the x-intercepts for any quadratic ever or any function ever, we set it equal to zero. So we're going to take this and say, I'm going to have x squared plus 7x plus 6 equal to zero. And we're going to solve that. And in solving that, we're going to find out where the height of our function equals zero. We're going to find the x values that make the height f of x zero. That means we're going to find out where we cross or touch the x-axis if we do. So one thing I want to mention real quick before we move on, with factoring, you're not going to get imaginary numbers. So this technique will not give that to you. You would need quadratic formula or completing the square to do that. Um, so for factoring, it, it's going to show you if you cross twice or bounce the vertex off the x-axis one time, if you can actually factor it. That's what that's going to give you. Secondly, we're going to kind of juxtapose this with, with the square root method. So we're looking at this go, what? Does the square root method work? And if it does, great, use it. If not, why not? So let's take a look. The square root method worked if we could isolate a power two where it had all of our x's instead of a power two, no x's anywhere else, and a constant other side. Can we do that here? Can we get that power two by itself? Yes, we could subtract six and subtract seven x. Would it contain all of our x's? No. Would we have just a constant on the other side? No. And for that reason, the screw root method is not going to work on problems like any of these is because we don't have that power to kind of contained or containing all of our x's. That's a problem. If we start subtracting 7x, well, then we don't have all of our x's inside the power 2. Is there a way we could make the screw root method work? And the answer is yes. We could make it work by doing something called completing the square giving this something that you could make that factorable. So say, how, how would I make that work? You would do something called completing the square. Completing the square is the way you change something that's not factorable into something you can do the square root method on. Uh, that, that's what completing the square does. Completing the square also gives us a way to create the quadratic formula. So the big scheme of things what we're doing is we're finding x-intercepts of quadratics that are all parabolas, upward opening and downward opening. The easiest way is square root method. That's if we can isolate power two that has all our x's. Second, we try factoring and go, all right, let's, let's do that. Third is we make the square root method work by doing something called completing the square. And third is what if we complete the square all the time in general? Ah, that gives us the quadratic formula, which is a very nice all the time working sort of a technique. So we look here and we go, can we do the, the square root method? Uh, no, that screws it up for us. Can we factor? Here's what factoring does. Factoring takes a polynomial and it breaks it up into things that are multiplied together. These things are called factors. There's a variety of ways to do it. I'm going to give you my way. So I'm going to show you the math behind it, and then I'm going to show you a shortcut with it. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to really show you the shortcut uh, with these two. I'm going to show you the shortcut here and then backwards map it and say, 
here's why the shortcut, you understand why it works so well. So let's take a look at it. One thing that we can do is we need to make, well, one thing we have to make sure we do is when we have a, a polynomial in general or, or a quadratic specifically, that on the left-hand side, in order to factor appropriately, we have to have everything in order. So like x squared, then our x term, then our constant. We have to have a zero on one side so that this thing called the zero product property works. We'll talk about that in a minute. And third, we want to make sure that our first term is positive because it makes our factoring easier, because it makes some of our techniques even possible. So let's, let's check that. We said equal to zero to find x-intercepts. Got it. Uh, we have this all on one side and zero on the other side. Got it. We have all those in order. Perfect. And our first term is positive. Fantastic. This is how I want it set up for factoring. Next, I'm going to give you a technique. I've I call it the diamond method. I don't know why it looks like an X, um, but it's a way, it's just a graphic organizer for us to kind of, uh, kind of picture some numbers and what they have to be. So what I want to do is I'm going to look at our middle term, our B term, if we think of this as AX squared plus BX plus C, our A would be one, our B would be seven, and our C would be six. What I want to do is I want to take my B number. It's a coefficient. It's just a number. It's always sign specific. So in this case, it would be positive seven, not negative seven. I want to put that up here. I'm going to look at my A times my C. The A here would be one the C would be six. I'm gonna multiply those two things. Now, you probably understand that it, that's not super important here because one times six is just six, it's just C. But for these later ones, it would be very important. So I'm gonna take one times six, and I'm gonna put A times C, that product there. Now here's what we need to happen in order for factoring to work. We need to find two numbers, we're gonna put them here and here, that add to B, and then multiply to a times c. Add to this top number, multiply to the last number. It's kind of on you in order to figure those out. I'm going to give you a couple hints. I'm going to give you hints like, hey, if you're multiplying to a positive number, so we're going to add to this one, we're going to multiply to these, that one. If you're multiplying to a positive number, your signs have to be the same, either both positive or both negative. If you're multiplying to a negative number, you'd have to have different signs, one negative, one positive. That's got to happen. So here, since we're multiplying to a positive number, we know that our signs are going to be the same, both positive and both negative. Since we're adding to a positive number, they would both have to be positives. You can't add two negatives and get a positive. You multiply two negatives, get a positive. But these would both have to be positive numbers. That narrows down our search for us for a pretty well. And so what we're going to think of is what numbers multiply to six that literally add to seven. I want to tell you this also. If your signs are the same, you are literally adding to that number. If your signs are different, this will be the difference between these two numbers. We'll see that in just a minute. So I'm thinking about this going, all right, I got seven, I got six, that's one times six. Make sure you do that. I'm thinking, I have to have both same signs because I'm multiplying to a positive. Both have to be positive because I'm adding to a positive. So I'm thinking what numbers multiply to six, uh, two and three, uh, one and six. What pair of that actually adds a seven? Oh, one and six. It does not matter what order you put these in. What matters is that you get them right. Double check it before you go any further because if, if these are wrong, you're wasting your time. So does one plus six add to seven? Yeah. Does it multiply to six? Yeah. I guarantee if you can find those numbers, this will be factorable. And I guarantee if you can't find those numbers, um, either the, the problem is too, too complicated, um, probably not the case, or it's not factorable and we need a different technique. So does factoring work all the time? No. Is it really cool when it does work? Yeah. And it can be very, very fast. So we found these numbers and here's what they do. What this does for you, it doesn't do the math for you. You did all the math. You just have an organizer to help you think of these numbers. What those numbers do, notice how they add up to that number. What they're going to do is they're going to allow you to split that middle term from one term into two terms. Why would we want to do that? Well, because we know something called factoring by grouping. If you don't know that, 
you need to check out the factor in my group units in intermediate algebra. And this is all review for us, but I'm just showing you the great techniques because people tend to miss them. What, what that does, what this idea, since this adds to the middle term, since this adds to the 7x, that means I can take the 7x and instead of 7x, I can write it as 1x plus 6x. Well, that's still 7x, but it takes, let's see, three terms into four terms so that I can group them together. It's really hard. So these numbers say, instead of 7x, write them as these two numbers. Write them as 1x plus 6x, 6x. Notice that's still 7x, but it's changed these three terms into four terms so that now I can group the first pair and group the second pair, and it will factor. So grouping works like this. If you're if you're unfamiliar with grouping, if it's if it's been a while, grouping takes a look at your first two terms and it says factor out a common factor, greatest common factor, which in this case is x. And if we do that, we would get x plus one. It says look at your second two terms, but before you factor anything. Goodness sakes, drop down that plus sign, or a minus sign if it's a minus. And now factor your GCF, your greatest common factor, from your second two terms. So 6x plus 6, you, uh, I would factor out 6. Cool. One thing that bears mentioning right now, you're factoring like this using the diamond method or, or whatever X method, whatever you want to call it, whatever method you use. It, it's predicated on the fact that you would have done a few things. It bears repeating, so, so please get it, that you set your function equal to zero, you have all of your stuff on one side, but it's in order and your first term is positive, and you have factored a greatest common factor from the beginning if you had this. So really what I should have said is when you've done this, or when, when you've done this, Look here and factor out a GCF if there is one. Now, there wasn't one. There, these didn't have a common factor at all. We're going to see that this one does. So I'm, I'm going to tell you that when we get there, but I want to make sure you get it now. So we've set this equal to zero to find x-intercepts. We have it organized on one side in order, first term positive, so that we can factor. We've tried the square root method. It didn't work. We've looked at factor and GCF. There wasn't one. Then we say, can we do this? Can we factor this uh, trinomial by, um, by like an x method or diamond method? Yep, we put our middle number, our a times c, our b, our a times c. We find out two numbers add to the middle one. Why? So that we can split it. Why? So that if we have four terms, we can factor by grouping. So we group the first two, group the second two, and if you found these two numbers, I guarantee that this is going to be the same. You have now, you have now created a GCF, a greatest common factor of x plus 1. That's something that we can factor. So when we factor this x plus 1, it creates this other factor for us. So when we factor x plus 1, when we, when we remove it by division, just like we did here, we said, hey, these both have an x, put it out front. These both have a 6, put it out front. Create some sort of a factor. Because these both have x plus 1, we're putting that out front. We're creating some sort of second factor that only has x plus 6 in it. So we factor by grouping x plus 1. Whatever's left over goes in a second set of parentheses, another factor, x plus 6, and we still have it equal to 0. Now, some of you right now are thinking, you just wasted a lot of time because can't you just do x plus 1 and x plus 6? And the answer is sometimes. Uh, you can do that if your a is 1. You can do that if your a is 1. Now, I'm going to ask this question. Why does that shortcut work? And most of the people out there go, don't know. It just does. My teacher told me that. Your teacher's right. If your a is 1, if your a is 1, this technique is fantastic. You find a couple numbers and you go, oh yeah, all right. Um, I could just do x plus this number and x plus this number, or if they're minus, negatives, do x minus the number, whatever the signs say the same as what you have. And you go, these create factors for you. My question is, why do they do that? Why? Part of it has to do with the grouping. I mean, I showed you this. This is the math behind it. This says set equal to zero. Come with these so that you can split your middle term, do your factor by grouping, and it works great. Question is, why does it always work great?
What is the shortcut from here to here? Is it just taking these factors? If that's a shortcut, then it should work all the time. Does it work all the time? No, because if your A is not one, you cannot do this right from there. It's not possible. I'll show you a way that is possible. Okay, let's get, we'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, from here, you're not quite done. You have something called the zero product property. Or you go, you know what? If we have two factors that equal zero, two factors that are multiplied together that equal zero, the only way that that can actually work is if one or the other of the factors equals zero itself. Because zero times anything else gives you the zero. So x would equal negative one and x would equal negative six. And then we answer, that's not a negative six. Then we answer the question, what are those? Because sometimes we get wrapped up in the technique and we forget it. What, what are those? Those are x-intercepts. So we knew this was a parabola. We knew we were finding x-intercepts. And I told you at the very beginning that factoring will always give you real solutions if it's factorable. So these are two real solutions. This is where this upward opening parabola will cross the x-axis twice. That's extremely important to know. Uh, that's what we're doing here. So it's just another technique. It is like the square root method in that it gives you x-intercepts. It's just a different way to go around it. So we said equals zero. We say square root method don't work. We said, well, we tried GCF for factoring. It didn't work. We have it in order. One side, first term positive. We factor with our technique. Can't use a shortcut. Yes, sometimes we're kind of fleshing that out right now. We'll talk about why that shortcut works in just a minute. I'm going to hold you in suspense for the first time like ever because I can't explain it yet, but I will explain it. Uh, and, and then we're finding x-intercepts and determining that this is where the parabola crosses the x-axis. Let's move on. Let's talk about the next one. So what in the world do you do to find x-intercepts? That's, that's what we're doing here in all these videos. Well, we set it equal to zero. So we have a 3x, x minus 4 minus 36 equals zero. Yeah, all right, that's, that looks kind of nasty. Uh, how in the world do I solve that? Let's see. The first thing we would try is we would try the square root method. Do we have something raised to the second power that contains all of our x's? No, we don't. We don't even have a second power up there right now. So when that happens, the square root method is off the table for now. There's ways we can get back to it called completing the square. Uh, but right now, this is not a good candidate. What we do have to do is if the square root method is not a good candidate, then we have to distribute. We don't want to distribute if the square root method is going to work, but if it's not going to work, we have to. So we, we look at it, we go, it's finding x-intercepts, that's zero. We look at it, we go, okay, uh, square root method, I don't see anything that contains all of, our, all of our x's raised to second power. That means we have to distribute. Barring some special technique, like uh, there's some sort of substitutions that we can do that avoid that, but this isn't one of them. There's nothing that's the same in, in two spots that we can substitute. So we distribute. And we make sure we have this in the proper order for factoring. So we've tried square root method, but then we go, that doesn't work. The next thing we try is factoring. So let's look at it. Is this all on one side? Yeah. Is it in order? X squared, then X's, then constants? Yeah. Is the first term positive? Yeah. This looks perfect for factoring. So we've, we've set this up. This is really good. Uh, now we try our factoring. So when we, when we set up factoring and we have everything on one side in order first term positive, the first thing that we're going to try to do is factor out some sort of the greatest common factor if there is one. Now there wasn't here, but there is here. And this is going to save you a tremendous amount of time. A lot of students avoid this, avoid factoring the GCF, and then their factoring gets horrible. And they go, man, that's really big. Or they plug numbers into quadratic formula that are enormous, and they don't have to do that. So when we factor, always try it when we do any of these techniques always try for a greatest common factor first. We look at it and go, hey, is there anything that divides 3, 12, and 36? And go, yeah, actually 3. Let's factor out the 3. That's a greatest common factor. Sometimes you might even see it like 3x cubed minus 12x minus squared minus 36x, and you can factor out a 3x. The x would give you a factor of, uh, of zero. You'd say so you have one x-intercept of zero, and then you'd factor the rest of it. So you can see that. We're not going to deal with it here because we're strictly dealing with quadratics, uh, but that is possible. You always check for a greatest common factor first. Sometimes you can get additional solutions there. So we look at it. Now, what's the 3 do? That 3 does absolutely nothing as far as your x-intercepts. It does not have a... a 
a factor that contains a variable, and therefore this will not be set equal to zero. Three doesn't equal zero. 3x, that's a different story. So if we had a factor out here that you'd factor out a, a GCF from all of your terms that had x, then yeah, we'd have a, a zero of x equals zero. Uh, but we, we don't. So where we find our x-intercepts are just dealing with these, these expressions that have variables in them. So like the x squared minus 4x minus 12, that's what we're looking at now. We don't even really care about the three. We're not going to lose it, but we're, we're sort of going to ignore it uh, as, far, as far as our factoring and our using zero product property. So let's go through it. <clears throat> let's go ahead. Let's identify our A and our B and our C. So our A here is, man, we don't, we're not worried about three. We're worried just about right here. Our A is one, our B is negative four, and our C is negative 12. So let's put negative four here. One times negative 12 is negative 12. That's a big deal. I don't want you just to put the C. I want you to put the A times the C. One times negative 12. And now we're going to think about two numbers that add to negative 4 and multiply to negative 12. Sometimes for some people, these come really easily. And they just get them because they're good at their factor tables. Sometimes it's not that easy for people. So I'm going to give you some good ways to go through it like I did before. If you're multiplying to a negative, your signs have to be opposite. One will be negative, one will be positive. Make the first one negative and the second one positive. Not because the order matters, but because when you get to the grouping, it's easier to have a plus here and not a minus because you want the change signs. So if, if it's not possible, then yeah, you, if you have two, two negatives, that's not possible, but if you have different signs, put the minus first. It'll be a little bit nicer for you. So I know that I'm multiplying to a negative, that means my signs are different. I know that I'm adding to a negative, that means that that's the difference between the two numbers. So if they add to negative four, that means my signs are opposite, and my signs are opposite, that means they'll have a difference of four units in there. So I go, all right, well, uh, what, what numbers multiply to negative 12? Well, there's 12 and one, uh, there's, there's two and six, and there's three and four. That's the only ones I can think of that are whole numbers. Which one of those have a difference of four? Well, six and two do. Which one will be the negative one? Because I'm adding to the negative four, I need the bigger of those two numbers in absolute value to be the negative. So I, I can't have this as negative two and six that I deposited four. I'm gonna have that as negative six and two. That multiplies negative 12, that adds negative four. I double check my work. I know that this is right. That's the only time that you go on from here. So you make sure that that works. Now, will, the, will a shortcut work? Yes, it will. It will work. This is going to end up being x minus 6 and x plus 2. We know that because our a is 1, and that's going to work. Um, what I'd like you to understand is the grouping as well. So what this does practically, it says because these add to your negative 4, because they add to your middle term, I could take x squared. Instead of minus 4x, I put minus 6x plus 2x minus 12 equals zero. Notice, I haven't forgotten about the three. It's still there. It's not going to affect our solutions at all. It's not going to affect this factoring at all, but it, it is still going to be there. We don't want to lose track of that. So I've looked at it. I've said, okay, this is factoring. I've come up with two numbers that are allowing me to split up my middle term, negative six and positive two x. So negative six x and positive two x, those would combine to give me negative four x. So it's the same thing, but it's taken three terms into four terms so that we can group them together. That's what we are doing. Why I told you to put the negative first was because when you group things, you always have to drop down this middle sign. And if this is a negative, you start changing signs. You have to divide out negatives. It's going to change your signs. And if I can avoid sign errors for you, I do. So I'm going to put my positive last so that I don't have to change signs. Dividing out my GCF for my first two terms, that's just x. We get x minus 6. I have to bring down my plus, see how if that's a minus, it's start divided by a negative. That's, that's, not so, that's not great to do for sign errors. We'd have to factor out a two. This says you're factoring a positive two. My signs are not going to change. And now that I've done that, I've created a GCF. I've created this common factor x minus six that we can factor out. So when I remove it by division, I have an x plus 2 
and I drop down that three. I do not distribute the three. Don't worry about it. It's not going to affect these factors at all. So it's still there. That was our GCF at the beginning. What are our solutions? Well, our solutions say set every factor, listen carefully, set every factor that has a variable equal to zero. Three doesn't have a variable. It's just coefficient for us right now. This has a variable, so x minus six equals zero. And this has a variable, x plus two equals zero. That means x equals six and x equals negative two. Could you go directly from here to your factors? Yes, and I'll show you why in about five minutes, uh, 10 minutes. Secondly, some people will tell you this, and it's true. Can you find your solutions or your x-intercepts just by looking at these and changing your signs? Yes, you can. Yep, so your solutions here are negative one and negative six. Your solutions here are positive six and negative two. That actually does work. If you don't have to show your work and you're just doing this to find your x-intercepts or to find out, that's basically it, you can just change your signs and it will work uh, because of the, the way that we the way that we set the zero product property equal to zero and our signs change. So that does work. You can go here and go, yep, solutions are positive six and negative two and you have them right there. That's something that you can do. Good idea to do it? I don't know, it kind of depends on what you're doing, uh, but it is possible. I hope it's making sense here. I hope you understand the idea that we're still setting equal to zero. It's just another technique when square root method doesn't work. Um, does factoring always work? No, that's why we have an, two other techniques coming. One that works all the time, and then we use it to create the quadratic formula. All right, let's move on. We're, we're having a good time, right? It's <laughs> doing great. Is it a quadratic? Yeah. Power two says that. Is it a parabola? Think about whether it's upward opening or downward. This happens to be upward opening. And now we're gonna think, let's find x-intercepts. So when we do that, we're gonna set this equal to zero, but we're gonna be smart about it. We're gonna say, because this is out of order, when I set this equal to zero, I'm gonna put it in order so that our exponents are descending in power. So the x squared term should come first, then our x term, then our constant term, and then zero on the other side. Is it all on one side? Yeah, it looks really good. Is it in order? Yes, it's in order. Is my first term positive? Fantastic it is. This is the setup for all of our solving techniques. Can you do them differently? Yes, but this is the easiest way to go. Then we start going through it. Can you do the square root method here? Can you isolate a power two and take a square root? No, because that x messes it up. I don't have every all of our x terms inside something being raised to second power. So, so no. Can I do factoring? Yep, it's set up for that. Let's try it. One thing we try is we would try to do a greatest common factor first. Can I factor out a number and or variable from all three of these terms? No, not even close. There's nothing that divides all of them. So it's not like this problem where we had that. This fails that. So let's try to go ahead and let's factor just like we did. Let's set up some sort of a technique, I call it the diamond method, to help us factor this. If our a is three and our b is five and our c is two, then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put my b up here. I'm gonna put my a times my c, not freaking two. We're doing three times two, we're doing six. We're getting a six here. And then we're gonna find two numbers that add to five and multiply to six. Now, now look, we're multiplying to a positive number. If we're multiplying to a positive number, signs have to be the same. If we're adding to a positive number, they have to both be positive. Think of some numbers that multiply to six that actually add to five, not have a difference of five, actually add to five. So same sign, you're adding to the top number. Different signs, this will be the difference between the two numbers. I think, okay, let's see, um, I have three and two, I have six and one, that's the only things I can think of. Six and one, do those add to five? No, they don't, they add to seven. Three and two, do those add to five? Yes, and because we have the same sign, that works. It does not matter the order, three and two. Yeah, all right, so you're done, right? Because we just go, yeah, it's easy. Uh, X plus three and X plus two. And moving on, <laughs> let's go to the next. Does that work? Does it work, that shortcut that some of us really try to do? It, it doesn't. Because if you distribute this, you get x squared. You wouldn't get 3x squared. If we go directly to here and go, oh, our answers are negative 3 and negative 2 because I just changed signs. 
we get it completely wrong. This shortcut that we know works here and here doesn't work here. And that's a problem with shortcuts. If we have a shortcut that works some of the time, it's not a good shortcut. A shortcut should work all of the time. I'm going to teach you this in exactly three minutes. So what, what do you do? What do you do if the shortcut doesn't work? Number one thing you can do, go back to something that does work. Go back to this idea that what these numbers do is they add to five. These numbers can split up this middle term. These numbers can do 3x squared plus 3x plus 2x plus 2 equals 0. Yeah, they let you do grouping. You can totally do that. Group the first two. 3x would factor out of this. Get x plus 1. Bring down your middle term, or middle side. 2, positive 2 would factor out of this. You get x plus 1. You've created a greatest common factor of x plus 1. Factor it. That's x plus 1, that's 3x plus 2 equals 0. Because we have two factors and both of them have variables, we would set x plus 1 equals 0. We would set 3x plus 2 equals 0. And we would have solutions. Negative 1, negative 2 thirds. You'd think in your head, hey, those are real numbers. This is a parabola. It's upward opening. This is exactly where this parabola will cross two times the x-axis. These are x-intercepts. Now, you heard me say something that was true. You should be able to just change these signs and get solutions. Can you change these signs and get these solutions? No. What that means is that the shortcut, listen, because I know that some of you were taught differently. Uh, the shortcut you use to get from here to your factors and here to your factors is incomplete. Here's the complete shortcut. I hope that was exactly three minutes because that would be awesome. Maybe I just have to pause for like some time to make sure it's exactly three minutes. I'm not going to do that. Okay, so, so here's the, the real complete shortcut and where it comes from that I know that some of you have never seen unless you watch some of my videos. Here's how it works. Coming right back to here, coming right back to here, if you find these numbers, do everything the same. Get everything on one side in order. First term positive, put down your B, put down your A times your C, and find your numbers and add to this one and multiply to this one, and then do one additional step. Look at your A. Divide these numbers by your A. Your A here is 3. So take those numbers, divide by 3, and simplify what you get. This would be positive 1 over 1. Leave them as a fraction. This is already simplified positive 3 over 2. If you do that, I promise you two things. Number one, you can read your factors directly from here, and they will always be correct. Number two, you can change your signs of these numbers, and they will always be your solutions. That's a complete shortcut, people. So let's look at it. How do you read your factors if you need a factor? If, you don't, if you're not just looking for solutions, but you're looking for factors, look at your denominator. Your denominator will tell you how many x's your factor should contain. And your numerator will tell you the constant to add or subtract to or from it. So I'm looking at the denominator. This says you should have 1x in a factor and then add 1. Here's 1x and then you add 1. Did you get the math chills right now? You're like, what? That would be cool. This should say another factor should have 3x's and then you add 2. 3x's and then you add 2. That is how a shortcut works. Now, what's your solutions? 1 over 1 is 1, positive 1. Change the sign, that's a solution. 2 thirds, change the sign, negative 2 thirds, that's a solution. Now, why did I say this, this shortcut, why does it work, but it's incomplete? The reason why a lot of people don't understand why this shortcut doesn't work here is because they do not acknowledge that your a is 1. If your a is 1 and you divide by 1, just like I did here, but with I divided by 3, divide these by 1. Why? Because your a is 1. Look how this doesn't change your x. That's why the shortcut actually works. If I divide by 1, it's not changing what you're adding to or subtracting from your, your x's. It's saying, okay, if I divide by a is 1, you'll always have 1x. 
it's not changing these numbers. You'll always add or subtract that exact same number. You won't have to simplify it like we just did. That's why people lose the fact that these, tech, these shortcuts are the same. They just never make it that far. So this says you should have 1x in a factor and add 1. We actually had that. It was x plus 1. This says you should have 1x and then add 6. Yes, 1x and then add 6. That should equal 0. You should be able to change your signs. Positive 1 uh, would be negative 1. Positive 6 would be negative 6. That's where this shortcut actually comes from. Uh, well, it's the way I did it. Uh, it, it that's, that's where that would come from. So it's, it's this idea, but people lose the fact that this a is 1, and that's why you're able to go directly from these, fact, these numbers to your factors. That's why. So if you're going to do it and you just, just want your solutions, man, just divide by your A. Just simplify it and change your signs. That's the easiest way to go about doing it. I hope that makes sense to you. It's, it's a really cool shortcut that does work all the time. I'm going to show you just the shortcut down. Well, I'll show you both. I'll show you the factoring and the shortcut because we'll have a negative in there. I'll show you how that works. All right, let's get after it. So we all know what we're doing. We have a quadratic. Uh, we know it's a parabola. Let's think about it, though. That should be a downward opening parabola in your head. We're still finding x-intercepts. They're still done the same way. We're going to take this. We're going to set this equal to 0. We're going to make sure everything is on one side. It is. We're going to make sure it's in order. It is x squared, then x, then a, a constant. But we're going to make sure that the first term is positive. Um, maybe before that, you check the square root method. So will square root method work? Do you have everything, all your x's instead of a power 2? Yeah, you don't. That messes up. But we do want our first term positive. There's a couple ways to think about doing this. Mostly we just think about it and we just do it. Um, one way is you could add 2x squared, add 5x, and subtract 12 to both sides. You could divide out a negative. Or you could factor a negative and then multiply by negative 1 or divide by negative 1. Any of those ways essentially are just going to change every sign. Now, now listen, please listen. It is not a problem to change your signs when you're solving for x-intercepts. But keep in mind, you're not changing the sign of your original function. It still needs to be a downward opening parabola. The idea is that if I change the signs of a downward opening parabola, yes, it would make it upward opening. It would be a reflection. But if you reflect something on the x-axis about the x-axis, it doesn't change. If my sign on the x-axis is a non-sign, it's zero, and I change signs, it's not changing because it doesn't have a sign. So when we, when we change it, when we change our signs to positive 2x squared plus 5x minus 12 equals 0 by either, what I said before, adding these two terms, subtracting this one, or dividing anything by negative 1, or factor negative 1, multiplying or dividing negative 1, that's not going to change the parabola, and it's also not going to change our x-intercepts. They will still show up exactly the same because in reflecting x-intercepts, you don't change anything about them. They reflect about the x-axis, but they're already on the x-axis. They can't change. Now let's go through the process of, of solving for x. So uh, we're going we're gonna to try factoring. We're going to look at our middle. We, we know that a is 2, b is 5, and c is negative 12. So I know that 5 goes here. Not negative 12, but negative 24 is what we can put down there. We're going to add to 5. We're going to multiply to negative 24. So I'm thinking if I'm multiplying to a negative, my signs have to be different. I'm doing this on purpose. I'm putting these out of what the order I said so that you can see what happens when you do that. Uh, so I'm, I'm putting this, this minus second. I should have the minus first. I'm thinking, okay, if I'm adding to 5 and I have different signs, then the bigger number's positive, smaller number's negative, and there's a difference of 5 units between them. So I'm thinking, let's see, 24 is 24 and 1. That doesn't have a difference of 5. Uh, 12 and 2, no. 8 and 3, yep, yeah, that has a difference of 5. So different sign difference of 5, difference of that b. So I'm thinking this needs to be 8 and negative 3. That adds to 5. Cool. That multiplies to negative 24. Awesome. Let's say I wanted to be really quick about this. How I would do it, if I'm just looking for my, my x intercepts, I would take my a, whatever I'm working with, this 2, not negative 2, what I'm working with right now, take that 2 and divide. Simplify the fractions that you can. So positive 4 over 1, 8 over 2 and 4 over 1 are the same thing. I leave it as a fraction. Negative 3 halves, you can't simplify that anymore. I'm, I'm done. 
If I wanted to find my x-intercepts, one x-intercept, let's see, this is four, negative four. Another x-intercept, that's negative three halves, three halves. Done. I guarantee you that is where this parabola that's downward opening crosses the x-axis at those two exact values. That is the quickest way that I know how to use factoring to find x-intercepts. And now I gave it to you. Uh, what if you needed the factors themselves? Two ways to do it. One way is you can read your fraction that says you would have your denominator would tell you how many x's in a factor, so that'd be one x. Your numerator tells you what to add or subtract to or from it. Your denominator tells you how many x's. Your numerator tells you what to add or subtract to or from it. Can you see by using the zero product property, I'd have x plus four equals zero. I'd have two x minus three equals zero, and we would get those exact solutions. I need to pause for just half a second um, when that, and, and tell you there's, there's a slightly different way to consider this factor. Some people prefer to do this, x minus three halves as a factor. It's the same. So x minus three halves and two x minus three are giving you the same factor. I need you to be comfortable with both of those. So x minus four, great, um, or sorry, x plus four, great, or x minus three halves and x, two x minus three are the same factor. Here, here's why they're the same. Um, if I look at two x minus three and I solve for x, <clears throat> and I wanted to create a factor, couldn't you subtract three halves from both sides and get, let's see, I added three divided by two. Couldn't you just subtract three halves? Wouldn't a, wouldn't a factor equal zero by the opposite of the zero product property tell you a factor to be x minus three halves? It's, it's the same exact thing. In fact, if we just divide, uh, divide this both by two, so divide everything by two here, here, and here, you would get x minus three halves. So th that's a different way to write that factor, and I just wanted you to be aware of it. Okay, the, the last way is to use the grouping. Yeah, it's a little slower, but it does work all the time. So we'd have this 2x squared plus 8x. We'd use our original numbers, minus 3x minus 12 equals zero. We'd look at the first two and factor out a 2x. That's our greatest common factor for those two terms, x plus 4. Be careful if you have a minus second. If you have a minus there, you have to drop that down. When you factor out your GCF of 3, it says, no, 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 you have to factor out negative 3. What that does, it changes this sign to a positive x, and it changes this sign, whatever it is, it will flip your sign. That's a plus four. Sometimes we get sign errors because we, we drop the minus, but we forget about that. We just divide by three instead of negative three. Your sign's got to change if that term has a minus. And we get x plus four and two x minus three equals zero. And we get exactly the same thing. Man, I'm hoping you, you appreciate the technique I just gave you. Um, if you knew it before, cool. If not, do you see how powerful it is? Do you see that with very minimal work, you get your x-intercepts super fast? If you want to try that, um, actually, we'd go back and try that one. Uh, try all of these with, with that. Try the ones you're working on now. These are some special cases I just want to talk, talk over with you. So first one. Negative 12x plus 9 plus 4x squared. We're going to do it fairly quickly. I'm not going to show you the grouping any longer. That's a lie. I'm going to show you the grouping on all of them. I can't, I just can't, I can't not do that. I've got to be complete here. So I'm going to show you how to, how to solve this in just a special case that we get. So, so far we have, <clears throat> we have two real x-intercepts in every single one of these cases. Even here, these are two real x-intercepts. There's no i's. They're different numbers. So we know we're crossing the x-axis twice with that downward opening parabola. Let's do the same thing. So we have this function. It's, a, it's definitely quadratic. We know it's a parabola. In fact, it's upward opening because the term in front of my x squared, well, that, that sign is plus, plus. So that's a positive x squared. That's upward opening. In order to find x-intercepts, we would set this equal. To zero. But we're doing it in such a way that we're putting this in order first. So 
positive 4x squared minus 12x plus 9 equals 0. I'm thinking about the square root method. I'm looking at it going, can I do the square root method? Uh, no, because I don't have all my x's contained in the power 2. That doesn't work. Next thing we do is, can we factor? Well, we're certainly going to try. And because it's on one side in order and our first term is already positive, that's great. We're going to try factoring GCF. Can I factor GCF? Uh, no. No, there's nothing that divides 4, 12, and 9, and x squared x and not having an x. There's nothing that's in common with all three of those terms. So we're going to try to do our diamond method. I know that we're going to do negative 12 and 36, not 9. 4 times 9 is 36. And now we're thinking, wait, okay, hang on a second. Negative 12, positive 36. If you are multiplying to a positive number, your signs will be the same. But if you're adding to a negative, that means they both have to be negative. This is the only time where you can't avoid having a minus second in grouping. Here you could if you would have written them different. Here, here you can't avoid that. So if you do factor by grouping and you have two negatives, you're going to be changing signs somewhere. Now let's think. What two numbers add to negative 12 and multiply to positive 36? Well, they have to have the same sign. So what two number, and they're actually adding a 12, so what multiplies 36? Uh, 36 and 1, that doesn't add to 12. 2 and 18, that adds to 20. 20. Uh, 12 and 36, 12 and 3, no, that doesn't add to 12. 6 and 6, yep, 6 and 6 works. 9 and 4 doesn't work. 6 and 6. Negative 6 and negative 6 add to negative 12 and multiply to positive 36. Now, if you were listening to anything about what I said, if you divide by your A, and you simplify these, you change their sign, you're done. You have just found x-intercepts, guaranteed. Our x-intercepts are going to be positive 3 halves and positive 3 halves. What? Wait a minute. How in the world do you get the same answer twice? Oh, you got to see it. This is cool. What's that mean? You need to know what that means. This is a parabola, right? It's upward opening, right? We're finding x-intercepts, right? What does it mean we get the same answer twice? This is exactly what we were talking about before, like the, the, one of the first, first video on quadratics we had two videos ago. What does that mean to you? Does this cross twice? Does this bounce once? Does this completely miss? It can't completely miss because there's no imaginary numbers. Factoring can't give those to you. It doesn't cross because we have the same number twice. This is called a double root. So do we get two solutions? Yes. Are they the same? Yes. So really, how many do you get? You get one. You just get it twice. This is where the vertex will be. This right here is a parabola that touches our x-axis, opening upward, but just touches our x-axis right at x equals one and a half. So if you went over to one and a half, that's where that parabola is going to be. That's got to make sense. Uh, now, can you can you do a little bit more work if you were, if you wanted to do more work? Yeah, sure. I mean, you could you could write this as two x minus three because we have denominator minus numerator. Two x is minus three. Another two x minus three equals zero. And you go. Oh, well, look. Hang on a second. Wait a second. Wait. Wouldn't you do two x minus three squared equals zero? Yeah, check it. I'm going to wrap the whole, I'm going to wrap all our videos for us right now that we had on quadratics. Could you do that? Yep. Would the square root method work? Yep. Could you take a square root on both sides of the plus and minus? Yep. Would plus and minus the square root of zero still give you just zero? Yes, you get the same answer twice. Do you see the square root method at work? You'd have to add three and divide by two. You get the same exact thing. Do you see, going back to this, Do you see that if we wrote it slightly different, instead of having 2x minus 3 squared, could you have x minus 3 halves, like we talked about here? Could we have that squared? Yes, just divide both of them by 2. Or look here, do x minus 3 halves, same thing. 
Do you see how this is, check it out. See how this is a parabola? This is shifted right three halves. Whoa. That would have an x-intercept of three halves. That's the graph I just gave you. This is a parabola shifted right three halves. This needs to be coming together in your head that we have parabolas, the shifting, the x-intercepts, the vertex. They're all, they all should be trying to do the same thing. Get a better picture of your graph. Could you do it uh, a little bit different? Could you say, all right, well, you know what? I really like the grouping or I forgot my shortcuts or I just really like extra work. Um, and so I'm going to take this and do 4x squared minus 6x. You'd, have, you'd undo all this is minus 6x minus 6x plus 9 equals 0. Yeah, we do that. Factor by grouping, that's a 2x. You get 2x minus 3. Bring down your minus, factor out a 3, and you get positive 2x minus 3 because your sign change, you divide it by a negative here, equals 0. Well, that's 2x minus 3 and another 2x minus 3, and we're back to the same thing we just had, 2x minus 3 squared equals 0. There's a few ways to write it. You could, of course, do x minus 3 halves. That is appropriate and fine. Most people like this a little bit better, but it does tell you you're going to get the same solution twice. Or you say, well, um, how many factors do I have? Well, I have one, but it's repeated. So we'd set 2x minus 3 equals 0. We'd add 3, we'd divide by 2, and you get your 3 halves. Now, how many ways did I give you? Four, four different ways or something? I hope at least one of them makes sense. But I hope more than that, <clears throat> I hope that what I'm teaching you is that these techniques are, everything in, in parabolas is not like just different little segments. I want them to come together to make one cohesive idea about parabolas, what their x-intercepts are, that the shifting and the graphing and the vertex and, and the x-intercepts, they all work together. And I hope that you're now seeing that with some of these techniques that can appear to be completely unrelated, that I'm making them related for you. So that, that's my goal. Um, that's Man, that's about it as far as solving these, these quadratics. I want to talk just a little blurb about this one, and then we're going to be done. So this last one, this, uh, this x squared minus 5, is it a parabola? Of course. In fact, it's a parabola that's shifted down 5 units. So it's not moving left or right, just shifted down 5 units. That means it's, it's x, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, its vertex is going to have an x value of 0. That's what's going to happen, just shift it down 5 units. How to solve that for x-intercepts? Yes, you'd still set this equal to zero. You'd have it on, in order. It is on one side. Great for some positive. You got it. Uh, would the square root method work? Absolutely. The square root method would work if we add five to both sides and take a square root with a plus and minus. But I want to talk about factoring. You see, a lot of students will say, this is factorable x squared minus 25 is factorable, and you'd say, yeah, that's x minus 5 and x plus 5 equals 0, and you're done. Yeah, that's, that's easy. But then when we talk about x squared minus 5, they say, oh, that, that's, not, that's not factorable any longer. Yeah, it is. And, and this is sort of a problem in the way that we teach, is that students get here and they go, this is no longer factorable because that's not a perfect square. It's not a perfect square over, over whole numbers, over integers, but it is a perfect square over square roots. And so here's what I need you to know. I need you to know that this is still a difference of squares. It's just kind of weird. So when you have this, how's, how's a, a typical difference of squares actually work? Well, a typical difference of squares actually works because you can say x squared minus something else squared. And the something else that you get is just the square root of that number. You go with that. That's going to be 5. It's just the square root of that number. Now, what about x squared minus 5? Could we write this as x squared minus something squared? Yes. It's just the square root of that number. What I want you to get out of this is that you can factor anything, any quadratic, I should say, any quadratic that's x squared or something squared minus a number. So square minus number, you can factor that. Just take the square root and say it's going to be x minus the square root of 5. 
and x plus the square root of 5. Much like this would be x minus the square root of 25 and x plus the square root of 25. The same thing happens here. If you set this equal to 0, then x minus the square root of 5 is 0, and x plus the square root of 5 is 0, and x would equal square root of 5, and x would equal negative square root of 5, the exact same thing we'd get if we added 5 and took a square root with plus or minus. It works. I just need you to be prepared for that because when we get down to uh, polynomials in general and we factor it and you're left with linears and irreducible quadratics, this is not irreducible. This has to be factored still. That's x squared minus and plus some sort of number. Just take the square root of that and it is factorable. I'm going to leave it for there for right now. We'll, we'll revisit that when we talk about polynomials. I hope that made sense. I hope that you're, you're feeling pretty good about factoring right now. I hope that that new technique kind of stuck with you. Um, it's the fastest way I know how to factor and it works really well for me. So I hope it works well for you too. Next time we'll talk about completing the square. And we'll talk about why it works. And I'll give you the easiest way to do completing the square. I promise. It'll be the easiest way you've ever seen. So we'll rely on our knowledge of factoring to do that. And I'll see you for the next video.